Hello everyone and welcome to Future News Daily, where I bring you the latest advancements in technology, longevity, science, medicine, and AI. Today is Saturday, December 10th, 2022. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bells. With that being said, let's get started. So, first up today, paper-thin solar cell can turn any surface into a power source. So, MIT engineers have developed ultralight fabric solar cells that can quickly and easily turn any surface into a power source. These durable, flexible solar cells, which are much thinner than a human hair, are glued to a strong, lightweight fabric, making them easy to install on a fixed surface. They can provide energy on the go as a wearable power fabric or be transported and rapidly deployed in remote locations for assistance in emergencies. They are one hundredth the weight of conventional solar panels, generate 18 times more power per kilogram, and are made from semiconducting inks using printing processes. Uh, that can be scaled in the future to large area manufacturing. Because they are so thin and lightweight, these solar cells can be laminated onto many different surfaces. For instance, they can be integrated onto the sails of a boat to provide power while at sea, adhered onto tents and tarps that are deployed in disaster recovery operations, or applied onto the wings of drones to extend their flying range. This lightweight solar technology can be easily integrated into built environments with minimal installation needs. Quote, the metrics used to evaluate a new solar cell technology are typically limited to their power conversion efficiency and their cost in dollars per watt. Just as important as integrability, uh, the ease with which the new technology can be adapted. Of course, the lightweight solar fabrics are enable integrability. Is that a word? Providing imp impetus for the current work. We strive to accelerate solar adoption given the present urgent need to deploy new carbon-free sources of energy. This is said by Vladimir Bulovic, the uh, Faribor's Masik Chair in Emerging Technology. Joining Bulovic on the paper are co-lead authors, I'm um, sorry, I, can't, I cannot pronounce that, I'm a lecturer in engineering, a computer science graduate student at MIT, on the research is published today in Small Methods. So traditional silicone solar cells are fragile, so they must be encased in glass and packaged in heavy, thick aluminum framing, which limits where and how they can be deployed. Six years ago, the One Lab team produced solar cells using an emerging class of thin film materials that were so lightweight they could sit on top of a soap bubble. Wow. But these ultra-thin solar cells were fabricated using complex vacuum-based processes, which can be expensive and challenging to scale up. In this work, they set out to develop thin film solar cells that are entirely printable using ink-based materials and scalable fabrication techniques. To produce the solar cells, they use nanomaterials that are in the form of a printable electronic, uh, of printable electronic inks. Working in the MIT .nano clean room, they coat the solar cell structures using a slot die coater, which deposits layers of the electronic materials onto a prepared, releasable substrate that is only three microns thick. Using screen printing, a technique used similar to how designs are added to silk screen t-shirts, an electrode is deposited onto the surface, uh, the structure to complete the solar module. Um, there's a video here which I cannot play but here they have these thin solar cell um, of course showing how you could just attach it to seemingly anything um, so the researchers can then peel the printed module which is about 15 microns in thickness off the plastic substrate forming an ultralight solar device but such thin freestanding solar modules are challenging to handle and can easily tear which would make them difficult to deploy to solve this challenge the MIT uh, team searched for a lightweight flexible and high strength substrate they could adhere the solar cells to. They identified fabrics as the optimal solution as they provide mechanical resilience and flexibility with little added weight. They found an ideal material, a composite fabric that weighs only 13 grams per square meter, commercially known as Dyneema. This fabric is made of fibers that are so strong they were used as ropes to lift the sunken ship Costa Concordia from the bottom of the Med to Mediterranean Sea. By adding a layer of UV curable glue, which is only a few microns thick, they adhere the solar modules to sheets of this fabric. This forms an ultralight and mechanically robust solar structure. Quote, while it might appear simpler to just print the solar cells directly on the fabric, this would limit the selection of possible fabrics or other receiving surfaces 
to the ones that are chemically and thermally compatible with all the processing steps needed to make the device. Our approach decouples the solar cell manufacturing from its final integration, um, outshining conventional solar cells. So when they tested the device, the MIT researchers found it could generate 730 watts of power per kilogram when freestanding and about 370 uh, per kilogram if deployed on the high strength Dyneema fabric, which is about 18 times more powerful per kilogram than conventional solar cells. Um, a typical rooftop solar installation in Massachusetts is about 8,000 watts. To generate the same amount of power, our fabric photovoltaics would only add about 20 kilograms to the roof of a house, or about 40 pounds. They also tested the durability of their devices and found that even after rolling and unrolling a fabric solar panel more than 500 times, the cells still retain more than 90% of their initial power generation capabilities. While their solar cells are far lighter and much more flexible than traditional cells, they would need to be encased in another material to protect them from the environment. The carbon-based organic material used to make the cells could be modified by interacting with moisture and oxygen in the air, which could deteriorate their performance. Encasing these solar cells in heavy glass, as is standard with the traditional silicon solar cells, would minimize the value of the present advancement. So the team is currently developing ultra-thin packaging solutions that would only fractionally increase the weight of the present ultralight devices. Um, quote, we are working to remove as much uh, of the non-solar active material as possible while still retaining the form factor and performance of these ultralight and flexible solar structures. For example, we know the manufacturing process can be further streamlined by printing the releasable substrates equivalent to the process we use to fabricate the other layers in our device. This would accelerate the translation of this technology to the market. All right, so this is honestly really, really bullish. I mean, the, the uh, percentages of higher efficiency compared to regular solar panels that we have now, especially in the fact that this can <laughs> go onto any surface, that's... Yeah, that, well, I mean, we're going to see this literally everywhere. There's no reason why this shouldn't be on, I mean, every single surface, that it, as long as it's not intrusive. But, yeah, that's pretty cool. Moving on. Activated natural killer cells fight senescence in humans. So, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. This research focuses on peripheral, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs, a category that includes T cells, NK cells, B cells, and other immune cells that constantly send signals to one another. Senescence in these cells drives uh, senescence and other aspects of aging in other organs. Normally, NK cells keep the senescent cell population under control, a task that goes unaccomplished if they themselves become senescent. While the idea of using NK cells to fight senescence has become approved, have <laughs> has been approached. Uh, previous studies in this area were restricted to mouse models and in vitro experiments on which we have previously reported. So a protocol has already been developed for extracting NK cells from people, propagating and activating them, and then returning them to their donors. These cells are known as autologous auto <laughs> auto NK cells. Therefore, these researchers took the logical next step, with a total of five volunteers, they set out to determine whether or not uh, these new NK cells, or ANK cells, are a viable approach for affecting senescence in human beings. So the first thing the researchers did was to determine if they were correctly isolating and expanding the correct portion of cells. They found that after harvesting PMBC, PBMC cells, and applying their activation technique, an average of 91% of the results uh, were L, A, and K cells. So this number varied between uh, donors, while the sample size is too small to determine statistical significance in the respect. The 70-year-old donors, uh, PBMCs, resulted in the fewest A and K cells compared to the other donors who were all in middle age. So the researchers then determined if the technique they were using to activate and propagate the cells were effective against natural targets. So the activated cells were considerably more effective than their unaffected counterparts, destroying larger percentages of cancer cells and senescent cells at lower doses in vitro. So three of the volunteers, including the 70-year-old, received 1 billion A and K cells and were monitored for 30 days. These senescence markers, P16 and what 
the beta, gal, whatever these symbols are, both decline dramatically in all three of these individuals. PBMCs, after two weeks, the 70-year-olds return to approximately half of its initial high value after 30 days. Uh, one of the younger donors who has inflammatory bowel disease had many inflammatory markers substantially down-regulated by this treatment. So the final two volunteers underwent a much longer term experiment with 2 billion ANK cells injected at two separate times, uh, once at the beginning and once after 192 days. The effects were similar. The senescence markers were substantially decreased at the beginning of the experiment, rose over time, and were reduced once more by the second infusion of ANK cells. No adverse effects were detected in any of these volunteers. So in conclusion, while there were only a small handful of participants, the study is an eye-opening proof of concept and suggests that ANK cells can be valuable in at least temporarily ameliorating systemic inflammation and potentially delaying other aspects of aging. It may one day be possible to affect these cells that give rise to ANK cells, restoring their effectiveness and providing a powerful long-term weapon against infl uh, inflammation. That day might be a long way off, however, so a biotechnology company might determine that guiding an ANK cell-based therapy through clinical trials is a wise investment. All right, moving on. Another one related to aging. This one uh, postulates that aging is driven by unbalanced genes. Um, this is discovered by AI analysis of multiple species. So Northwestern University researchers have discovered a previously unknown mechanism that drives aging. In a new study, used, uh, researchers used artificial intelligence to analyze data from a wide variety of tissues collected from humans, mice, rats, and kill killifish. Oh. They discovered that the length of genes can explain most molecular level changes that occur during aging. All cells must balance the activity of long and short genes. The researchers found that longer genes are linked to longer lifespans and shorter genes are linked to shorter lifespans. They also found that aging genes change their activity according to length. More specifically, aging is accompanied by a shift in activity towards short genes. This causes the gene activity in cells to become unbalanced. Surprisingly, this finding was near universal. The researchers uncovered this pattern across several animals, including humans, and across many tissues. This includes blood, muscle, bone, and organs, including liver, heart, intestines, brain, and lungs analyzed in the study. So the new finding potentially could lead to interventions designed to slow the pace of or even reverse aging. The study will be published on December 9th, um, which would have been yesterday, in the journal Nature Aging. Quote, the changes uh, in the activity of genes are very, very small, and these small changes involve thousands of genes. We found this change was consistent across different tissues and in different animals. We found it almost everywhere. I find it very elegant that a single, relatively concise principle seems to account for nearly all of the changes in activity of genes that happens in animals as they age. So this was said by Northwestern's Thomas Stoger, who led the study. Um, another quote continues, the imbalance of genes causes aging because cells and organisms work to remain balanced, what physicians denote as homeostasis, um, said by Northwestern's Louis Amaral, senior author. Um, quote, imagine a waiter carrying a big tray. That tray needs to have everything balanced. If the tray is not balanced, then the waiter needs to put in extra effort to fight the imbalance. If the balance in the activity of short and long genes shifts in an organism, the same thing happens. It's like aging is this subtle imbalance away from equilibrium. Small changes in genes do not seem like a big deal, but these subtle changes are bearing down on you, requiring more effort. All right, so that's very, it's a very interesting take on this um, that I haven't really heard before. Um, so to, to conduct the study, the researchers used various large data sets, including the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, a National Institute of Health-funded tissue bank that archives samples from human donors for research purposes. So the research team first analyzed tissue samples from mice aged 4, 9, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months. They noticed the median length of genes shifted between the ages of 4 months and 9 months, a finding that hinted at a process with an early onset. 
Then the team analyzed samples from rats aged 6 months to 24 months and killifish from 5 weeks to 39 weeks. Quote, there already seems to be something happening early in life, but it becomes more pronounced with age, Stoger said. It seems that at a young age, our cells are able to counter uh, perturbations, perturbations, oh, perturbances, that would lead to an imbalance in gene activity, then suddenly our cells are no longer able to counter it. After completing this research, the researchers turned their attention to humans. They looked at changes in human genes from age 30 to 49, 50 to 69, and 70 and older. Measurable changes in gene activity according to gene length already occurred by the time humans reached middle age. So the result for humans is very strong because we have more samples for humans than other animals. Um, this is said by Amaral. Um, I guess the, hmm, is this the head of the project? Uh, professor of Chemical and Bio Biological Engineering. Yes, uh, so continuing. It was also interesting because all the mice we studied are genetically identical, the same gender and raised in the same laboratory conditions, but the humans are all different. So they all died from different causes and at different ages. We analyzed samples from men and women separately and found the same pattern. So in all animals, the researchers noticed subtle changes to thousands of different genes across multiple uh, across samples. This means that not just a small subset of genes that contributes to aging. Um, aging instead is characterized by system level changes. This view differs from prevailing biological approaches that study the effects of single genes. Since the onset of modern genetics in the early 20th century, many researchers expected to be able to attribute many complex biological phenomena to single genes. And I know we've, uh, you know, even people who aren't in this sector have heard about this before, finding certain genes for aging, certain genes for, uh, you know, for whatever, for people who more, have more proclivities to, you know, alcoholism, cancer, whatever. It's all, you know, the, the, the uh, prevailing ideology is that there are certain genes for each thing, not that it's a imbalance or, you know, of course, what they're putting forth here, which, you know, a lot of evidence here, and it kind of just makes sense to me, you know. Um, so anyway, I'll start this paragraph over. This view differs from prevailing biological approaches that study the effects of single genes. Since the onset of modern genetics in the early, early 20th century, many researchers expected to be able to attribute many complex biological phenomena to single genes. And while some diseases, such as hemophilia, do result from single gene mutations, the narrow approach to study single genes has yet to lead to explanations for the mirage changes that occur in neurodegenerative diseases and aging. So that theory has really, you know, proven very little. So, you know, it might be very close to getting debunked. You know, that's how science moves very slowly and then quickly. <laughs> so anyway, it continues, quote, we have been primarily focusing on a small number of genes, thinking that a few genes would explain disease, Amaral said. So maybe we were not focused on the right thing before. Now that we have this new understanding, it's like having a new instrument. It's like Galileo with a telescope looking at space. Looking at gene activity through this new lens will enable us to see biological phenomena differently. That sounds really exciting from their perspective. Um, after compiling the large data sets, many of which were used in other studies by researchers at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and studies outside Northwestern, Stoger brainstormed an idea to examine genes based on their length. So the length of a gene is based on the number of nucleotides within it. Each string of nucleotides translates to an amino acid, which then forms a protein. A very long gene, therefore, yields a large protein, and a short gene yields a small protein. According to Stoger and Amaral, a, a cell needs to have a balanced number of small and large proteins to achieve homeostasis. Problems occur when that balance gets out of whack. Although the researchers did not find, or did find, excuse me, the researchers did find that long genes are associated with increased lifespans, short genes also play important roles in the body. For example, short genes are called upon to help fight off pathogens. Um, some short genes could have a short-term advantage on survival at the same, uh, at the expense of ultimate lifespan, Stoger said. Thus, outside of a research laboratory, these short genes might help survival under harsh conditions at the expense of shortening the animal's lifespan. <clears throat> so this finding also may help explain why bodies take longer to heal from illness at, uh, as they age. Even with a simple injury like a paper cut, an older person's skin takes longer time to recover because of the imbalance, cells have fewer reserves to counteract injury. 
Instead of just dealing with the cut, the body also has to deal with this activity imbalance, and we're all hypothesized. Uh, it could explain why over time with aging, we don't handle environmental challenges as well as when we were younger. So I'm going to skip down a little bit. It's kind of a long article, um, but very, very interesting. I do enjoy this information. Um, <laughs> all right, so the researchers believe their findings could open new uh, Venuses, uh, venues, oh my gosh, venues for, develop, uh, for the development of therapeutics designed to reverse or slow aging. Um, current therapeutics to treat illness, the researchers argue, are merely targeting the symptoms of aging rather than aging itself. Amaral and Stoger compare it to try to using Tylenol to reduce a fever instead of treating the illness that caused the fever. Um, quote, fevers can occur for many reasons, Amaral said. It could be caused by an infection, which requires antibiotics to cure, or caused by appendicitis, which requires surgery. Here, it's the same thing. The issue is the gene activity imbalance. If you can help correct the imbalance, then you can address the downstream consequences. All right. Um, the study is titled, Aging is Associated with a Systemic Length Associated Transcriptome Imbalance. <laughs> wow. So I, I really, I'm, I hope you hear more about this. Um, yeah, this is very interesting. All right. I'm going to skip to the favorite of the day, or at least, you know, as per the... Uh, thumbnail. Um, Sony steps into the metaverse, metaverse with the Mokopi motion tracking system. So new metaverse, you know, toys coming here. So it will enable us to use your full body in the metaverse. Um, that's the, the biggest thing here. Sony has launched an interesting product called Mokopi consisting of six motion tracking bands worn on your hands, feet, back, and head with a price of about 358 US or 49,500 yen. The aim is to let you track your body to create videos or operate avatars in real time with metaverse apps like VRChat. It even offers an SDK that lets you import motion data into 3D animation apps. Apparently, a play on the, team, the term mocap, which is motion capture, Mokopi's six color-coded lightweight motion sensors use proprietary technology and a smartphone with a dedicated app, according to Sony. Normally, video production using motion capture requires dedicated equipment and operators, Sony wrote. By utilizing our proprietary algorithm, Mokopi realizes highly accurate motion measurement with a small number of sensors, freeing uh, VTubers, uh, virtual YouTubers, and created creators involved in movie and anim animation production from time and place constraints. On December 15th, Sony will provide a software development kit that links the motion capture data with Metaverse services along with the real-time development platform Unity and Autodesk's animation slash mocap app Motion Builder. Quote, this SDK expands the use of motion data for activities such as full body tracking. Therefore, facilities uh, facilitating the development of new services in areas such as the metaverse and fitness. In a how-to video, uh, which it has here below, which if you would like to click, you know how to find the link. <laughs> Uh, Sony shows you how uh, you can pair the sensors with the app, strap them to your body, and calibrate them. From there, you can start dancing or do other movements and see the in-app avatars see your actions, or, or ape your actions. A uh, second video showcasing some avatar animations looks good, but does reveal typical motion capture issues like jitter and foot sliding. So this might be the first iteration of this technology. Um, so we're seeing future advancements uh, for, for the next generations. It's, ambitious, uh, it's an ambitious product aimed at not only people interested in the metaverse, but animation professionals and filmmakers as well. Sony notes that you can use existing VRM avatars and export recorded videos in the MP4 format, provided you have a device with iOS 15.7.1 or Android 11. Um, reservations are set to start mid-December 2022, so right now, and it will go on sale in late January 2023 but there's no word yet on North American availability. I'm sure we'll get some uh, influencers, influencers to get their hands on some here in the U.S. Um, but, um, yeah. And last up I have for you today, Vivo Therapeutics launches with $12 million to discover better drugs. So Vivo Therapeutics, a biotech company using its Mosaic in vivo drug discovery platform and next-generation AI models to uncover better drugs for more patients, has launched with an oversubscribed and upsized $12 million seed financing round. I wonder which round that is. Series A, B, C, what have you. 
Hmm. Um, anyway, so it says with the seed funding, Vivo will perform thousands of mosaic experiments to create an in vivo atlas of how chemistry perturbs biology. Vivo's AI models will be trained on this atlas to uncover novel targets and drugs undetectable by other technologies. Vivo's platform builds on technology developed by two of its co-founders, Hanny Godarzi, associate professor at the University of California, and Johnny Yu, chief scientific officer of Vivo Therapeutics. The company holds an exclusive license to the technology from UCSF's Innovation Ventures office, which leads licensing and business development on behalf of the university. Um, quote, we found Vivo to address the key challenging, the key challenge in drug discovery, that drugs discovered in vitro models are failing patients. Huh. So drug discovery is only as powerful as the data that fuels it. And today, that data is generated out of context from how disease occurs in living organisms, while also failing to account for the diverse mosaic of genetic backgrounds across patients, each with the potential to react differently to any one drug. By starting and guiding drug discovery with high-resolution in vivo data, we are flipping the script on traditional discovery methods. So despite being the gold standard of disease modeling, in vivo models are not scalable or precise enough for early stage discovery, the company said. Um, limited to in vitro based uh, assays, early discovery efforts often overlook valuable targets that would only be detectable in vivo. Even when novel targets and drugs are found in vitro, many will be irrelevant when tested in vivo or in humans. Quote, most first generation small molecule drugs will work with limited efficacy in a small number of patients with improvements made slowly over the course of second and third generation advances. Um, so our ability to test drugs across many uh, patients and generate single cell data using in vivo models at the start of drug discovery will finally allow us to bypass generations of incremental improvements to get better medicines to patients faster, which is always the goal. All right. Well, that is the last article I have for you today. Um, don't forget this video is for educational purposes only. I will never recommend any investments, solicit your time or money, attempt to contact you on any other platform, or own any rights to the information within this content. And with that being said, thank you very much for tuning in. I will see you in the next one.